So I know that I did a similar video back at the start of the year, however I realised I focused a bit too much on the specifics of my degree rather than providing more general solutions that can apply to everyone. So what we're going to be talking about today is what it's actually like to run Linux in a practical software engineering degree. So if you're doing things like computer science where it's a bit more theoretical, a lot of what I'm going to say isn't going to apply. There will still be similarities, but I mainly know about what it's like to do things like Windows development, iOS development, and Android development, things like that. Things that you do in a more practical focused software degree. The first major problem area you're going to come across is anything to do with Microsoft technologies because even though Microsoft has been getting better in the past couple of years, most universities typically run a few years behind. So my degree specifically was using .NET. So we were doing things like WinForms and ASP.NET, which even though .NET Core is available on Linux, doesn't actually support these technologies, so you simply can't compile them. Now, if you're just doing general c -sharp programming, if your degree allows you to use macOS, you can actually get away with using Linux, because the macOS guys are going to have to use Mono, and Mono is also available on Linux. Now, C-sharp tooling isn't great on Linux. You can use things like VS Code, and you can get those language servers working in things like Vim. However, it's nowhere near as good as what Visual Studio can do. And if you're doing a database class, you may have to use SQL Server. Now, SQL Server itself is actually available on Linux. However, if you're doing an entry-level database class, they might also require you to use SQL Server Management Studio. Now, SQL Server Management Studio that's only available on Windows. So even though the database server itself is available on basically everything, if you have to use that program specifically, you're kind of stuck. Another big problem area is anything that touches the Apple ecosystem. So if you do any macOS development or iOS development, this is a problem for the Windows guys as well. You have to be using macOS and generally you have to be using a fairly modern version of macOS as well. Luckily for us though, there actually are ways to get around this. Now, if you're just doing Swift development, which isn't really that popular right now, but it may gain popularity in data science in the future, you actually can do that on Linux because there is actually a Swift compiler available for it. Also, game development with a game engine can be a bit of a problem as well. Now, both Unity and Unreal are actually supported on Linux, so for general game development, it's fine. However, in the case of university, you typically have to use a very, very specific version number. So they'll say, use like 2019.2.0. And that was actually what I had to use for Unity. This version did actually make it to Linux, but there's no guarantee that the version that you're being told to use actually ever got released on Linux. So if it's some like 2019.2.17f, it's possible that just never became available. And the same problem also exists on macOS as well. The other issue I have is one that didn't really become an issue until this year, and that is any exams that require you to use Respondus or the Lockdown Browser. These tools are basically pieces of spyware to track everything that you do during an exam. And these tools are simply not available on Linux. And to make it more annoying, they have VM detection code and also remote machine detection code as well. So if you're remote into a machine, these tools just won't work, which makes them really, really annoying to deal with. Now, assuming you have the hardware requirements to just make it usable, for everything except the last problem, you can always just go and run a virtual machine. Now, for Windows, Microsoft doesn't really care if you never put in a product key. It will have a little watermark in the bottom that will bother you about it, but that's basically all that ever happens. On the macOS side though, I'm not going to include a link on how to do this, but there are ways to get yourself a macOS ISO. It's technically not legal, so I'm not going to link it, but you can find it very easily with a simple Google search. However, if you know someone that owns a Mac, you can get an ISO through that method as well. I would say your next best solution is just fork out the money and go and buy like a 128 gig SSD because in Australia, they're like $50, so I don't know, they're probably like $30 or $40 in the US because our currency is worthless. Just go and buy a cheap SSD, install the operating system you need on it. In the case of macOS, it's going to be a bit more annoying to do that just because macOS is very particular about the hardware it runs on. So in the case of macOS, if you can't get it working on a second hard drive, a good solution is to actually go and hire a macOS VPS. So there's services like, say this one right here called Mac in the Cloud. And basically it lets you hire a Mac in the Cloud. Obviously there's privacy concerns with this, but if you're just using it for your assignments, 
it's not really that big of a deal. And the same things do exist on the Windows side as well. If you can though, I prefer the SSD solution because once everything's done, if you don't need the SSD anymore, now you just own a 128 gig SSD and you can just go and back up some data or do whatever you want with it. There's no reason you have to get rid of it. Now, most lecturers luckily don't really care about formatting. They just want it written in a sensible way with some, some sort of sensible formatting. But there are some lecturers who are very, very particular about the way their assignments are laid out. If they give you a specific LaTeX template or they say use this specific IEEE template or some other sort of template, that's fine because there is a LaTeX engine available in literally every distro standard repos. Or if you want to, you can do it online in something like Overleaf and that comes with the nice benefit of doing collaboration. But there are times where your lecturer will say, I need this to be a docx file and I need this to be formatted exactly the way that I say it's formatted. So LibreOffice, OpenOffice, FreeOffice, they're all great 99% of the time. However, they have some incompatibilities. For example, recently I had a image file. I had it sized a specific way in my ODT file. I converted it over to docx and it completely moved to a different page. So things like that can definitely happen. So I would say never, even if you're allowed to do so, never ever submit an ODT file because it's probably certain that your lecturer is going to be using Microsoft Word and something will break. Also, if you can avoid doing so, try not to submit docx files as well because if you convert it in something like LibreOffice, as I said, there's going to be some sort of compatibility issue and it's just not going to work properly. If you can, always submit PDF files. They will look the same on every single system. But if you do need to submit a docx file, I would say everything that you submit, make sure you go and put it into something like Office 365. Basically, every school email will give you free access to this service. Just go and upload the file to it, reformat it, do, do everything to make it so it works properly, and then submit the version that you download from that because you can guarantee that's actually going to be supported inside of Microsoft Office. I don't like having to use Office 365, but it's a reasonable sanity check. Now, I would suggest not actually writing everything in Office 365 because it has some completely broken features. For example, you can't do things like insert a table of contents. There's just no button for it. You can update a table of contents, but you can't insert it. And there's a bunch of other things like that, like equations that just don't work. Don't write it in Office 365, write it in some other sort of editor, put it in there and go from there. Or if you really want to, because you have this school email, you can go and install, you know, the Microsoft Office suite on that Windows install you've made for your other assignments and just go from there, which might be the most compatible solution. Now, there are a lot of things that are just non-issues. So when it comes to doing things like general programming, if you have to do, say, like a, a Python assignment or a Java assignment or a, I don't know, basically any other sort of language, there's no reason why you can't do it on Linux. In a lot of cases, the language came out first on Linux anyway. And if you don't like using Vim to write your code, every single IDE you should care about is available on Linux anyway. So things like Eclipse, the JetBrains suite, that's the only one on this list you should actually care about. Qt Creator, Android Studio. Actually, Android Studio is nice. It is based on the JetBrains suite, but having that like Android emulator built into it actually is a nice feature for doing Android stuff. Or if you want to use a code editor, you have VS Code, Sublime, Atom, things like that. Or just build it yourself and use something like Vim or Emacs. And I don't know about other schools, but my school has an obsession with doing every single diagram it can possibly do in UML. And there's plenty of UML tools available on Linux. So things like UMlet has a web version, but it's just a Java application anyway. So there's no reason why you can't just download it and run it on your system. And Dia is my personal favorite. That one I think is only available on Linux, but it's a pretty useful tool. And Dia can be used for a bunch of other diagramming formats as well. So maybe if your school isn't obsessed with UML, it will be using something that Dia supports anyway. And another thing that's really big right now is online lectures. So all of the tools that are being used have web clients anyway. So WebEx and Zoom are the two big ones. But in the case of Zoom, if you want to use the Linux client, there is a Linux client available. Now, it's very rare for this to happen, but there will be these few times where being on Linux actually makes everything easier. So for example, if you're doing say like a Linux introduction class where you have to do things like bash scripting and working with the core utils, 
you're already on Linux anyway, so everyone else in your class, except for the macOS people, are going to be running a VM. You, though, can just run your native system and not have to worry about it. Now, another thing is with Docker. So Docker is available on Windows. However, the Windows version is missing a lot of features, and any class that actually knows what they're doing is going to say, run Linux or use a Linux VM. Once again, you're already on Linux, so makes it easier. Or if you're doing anything with big data. So in the case of that, you're probably going to be using something like Hadoop and... Once again, if you're not running it on Linux, I have no idea what your class is actually doing. Now, as you can see, most of the time being on Linux is just like being on any other sort of operating system. Really, the only problems that start to arise are when you have to do classes that require you to use Microsoft or Apple technologies, or your lecturer just has... I guess nothing better to do with their time but specify very specific templates. For everything else though, you're probably going to be fine and even when you do have these problems, there are very simple solutions you can take that don't really cost that much money or in some cases are completely free. So hopefully if you were confused about what you were going to do, that actually helps you a bit. Now, I know that I could have said, oh here are these very specific Linuxy ways that you can go and get around all of these problems and do all of that. But in the end, you have more important things to be doing than trying to hack around with random Linux software. You're trying to get your degree done. So just take the easier approach and get it done like that. So I think that's pretty much everything for me. But before I go, I would like to thank my supporters. So a special thank you to Chris, Joachim, Donald Corbinian, Andre, Nathan, Monster, Chico Bento, Joseph, Peter D, Rode, Tony, Brennan, John, Marek, Mikkel, Nate Dog, Nephite, Poe, Tease, and Zilver. If you want to go and support my work, the links down below to my Patreon, Subscribe, Star, Libre Pay, all of that sort of stuff. I've got my podcast, Tech Over Tea, available basically anywhere. And then this channel is available on Library, Odyssey, and BitChute if you want to watch on a platform that isn't YouTube. So I think that's pretty much everything for me, and I'm out.